This is the Black Creative Handbook. My name is Cassandra Lauren Gordon. And I am here with... Dr. Idris Iradia. Yay! So tell us a little bit about yourself, Doctor. Thank you, Cassandra. So um, I'm a poet. I'm also a writer. I focus more on what I call reflective writing. So I like to write on basically my own life experiences. I write on the contemplations that I have in my head. Writing very much for me is therapy and a source of expression. And I do quite a few things. I consider myself as a multi-passionate artist, creative healer. So I incorporate quite a few practices and tools in this magic called life. Cool. So you have a lot there and I'm going to delve into that because I feel like we kind of are like doing so much different things. And I find sometimes it's really hard to market yourself because people are like, what are you doing? So I'll just yeah. say the one thing, like I'm, I'm a jeweler, but I make films. I produce, I do poetry, I perform, I do so, so there's so, but it's just easy. Like, I'm, I'm a jeweler and then people just leave me alone. So we're going to delve yeah. into that about how do you navigate when people think, oh, you know, anti multi stuff. People just like you do one thing, you know, sometimes. Yeah. So how do you combat that? So we'll talk about that later. But before that, we do these quick fire questions, just any questions, and you just think on the spot, be honest, be authentic, and just do that. <laughs> So I'll one try. of the, okay, one of the questions, are you an uh, uh, early bird or a night owl? Early bird for sure. And why? Oh, I love the sun. Like I love sunlight. I think that light just gives me a lot of energy and I like to work very much with like nature's cycles, natural cycles. So definitely I'm an early bird. Okay, thank you. Cereal or toast? Cereal. <laughs> and what type of cereal? Um, I'm gluten-free, so I try and avoid anything like wheat-based, but like just a lot of like the ancient grains, oat-based cereal, so like gluten-free cereal. Sounds very, very healthy. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what is the most used emoji you've used on your phone? Probably happy face. It's a safe one, isn't it? It's a yeah. safe one. I was going to ask you as well. So, if you could change your name, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. I've never really thought about it. Probably something like mountain, sky, yeah, or something to do with like the celestial bodies because I'm into astrology and all that. <laughs> okay, so what's your favorite planet? I don't have one, but like my top planets the moon would be one of them or like a celestial body but i don't have like the one and why does moons why are you attracted to moons or moons are attracted to you it's the embodiment of feminine energy the light the purity it's it carries a very soft and gentle nurturing energy to me that's what i associate it with so yeah it balanced me out okay interesting you're really into the healing we're going to talk about that okay so you did at the beginning you talked about all the stuff what you do but if I could if we could do like an elevator pitch and just narrow it down what is I know I'm trying to be horrible here I know I'm sorry no it's what good. Is the it's main good. thing like what is the thing which gives you the paycheck what is the main thing that you do the main thing would be my healing practice. Yeah, so like my natural healing practice um, and everything associated with that. Okay, so let's start with the healing practice. So you say you're a doctor, well, you're a doctor. You say you're a doctor. How did we start from here to a polymath? Let's start from there. So how did you start from being a doctor? <laughs> so all the great <laughs> things of what you're doing now. Thank you, beautiful question. So um, I trained in the UK in like conventional medicine. I worked in that for a few years, but I just kind of got like disillusioned with the industry. And I went on like my own kind of self growth, personal exploration um, process. And a lot of things just kind of like unfolded. And I started to, or the universe brought to me, you know, like ideas of like natural healing. And I've always felt very deeply connected with nature. And I just figured like us as humans, we're natural beings and we come from nature. So I think the best way for sustainable healing would be to align ourselves with nature. So I'm kind of like trying to like really summarize it. But uh, 
So I started exploring like things like sacred herbalism, nutrition, high vibration foods. Oh, I miss, I missed, I missed the first thing. What, what was the first thing you said? Something, something. Oh, sorry, sacred herbalism. So plant-based medicine and herbs and stuff like that. Nutrition, like um, plant-based um, supplements and things like that. And when I started incorporating some of these natural healing processes and practices in my life, I had a lot of health complaints and they kind of started to resolve. So that kind of brought me towards relocating to the United States where I train in naturopathic medicine, which is basically just like nature-based healing and Ayurvedic medicine. And I started to like incorporate that into like a holistic medical practice. And in terms of being a polymath, I've always been interested in the arts and creativity. To me, I see creativity as very, very powerful medicine. And I feel like in our westernized world, almost, it's almost like almost um, pushed to the background, like something people do more or engage in more for like entertainment or aesthetic pleasure. But for me as a physician, I could see the benefits of creative engagement to actually fostering our sense of well-being and healing so and me being a creative I've always enjoyed writing and poetry even all throughout medical school and I kind of almost like stifled it because I wanted to like be one thing and become on the specialist path but you just through um, a series of explorations and I got in contact well I watched this video a TED talk which was um, by Emil Wapnick and it was about like how some of us don't have a true calling or something like that. And I heard the term multi-potentialite, which is essentially just someone who's passionate about more than a few things in life. And it might not necessarily seem like they're connected. Like you could be a writer and photographer and interested in science and instruments and all those things show up in your life. And I just realized that I wasn't caught genetically, physically and mentally to just pursue one thing in life. I loved arts just as much as I love science and humanities. So I identify now as a polymath or multi-potentialite or multi-passionate creative. Wow, that's a, that's a lot. I know you're here for, to talk about the creativity, but there might be people in the audience who have, I would say, a traditional job and they want to get into the creative job. And I always talk about this, looking at my experiences where growing up with a lot of immigrant or black or brown people where their parents like, you've got to get your degrees you've got to be a doctor pharmacist or look so I'm just trying to navigate how you know the transition to creativity and leaving your doctor job being a person of color how did that happen please tell the yeah. truth because it's not I easy. Will. <laughs> you're right Cassandra it is not easy I'll be honest with you and I got that traditional almost like psychological pressure because I'm like, I grew up predominantly in the UK, in London, but I have a background like um, generationally, I'm like second generation Nigerian, which is West African to the UK. So a lot of traditional Nigerian parenting is very like pressurized, like you know, follow the standardized academic path. So I think I was a lot influenced by that as a teenager and through like my early twenties, sort of even late twenties. So I had that pressure but a part of me, I've always been kind of like a rebel. And, you know, up until, well, more from my early 20s, I started to kind of walk my own path and uncover my own truths. Because I think like ultimately you can be like influenced by people around you, friends, family, who sometimes come from a good place. But ultimately, like you're the one going to live your life. And if at the end of your life, which was the end of your life, you feel like you left some of your dreams behind, no one else is going to feel that pain but you. And when I started to really think about that I was like you know what it's not worth it people love you for who you are and if they don't that's okay you love yourself number one and the universe loves you so I just kind of like stepped into my own power and I realized like you know like words words for me have been something that have been so powerful in my life they're very healing I love to read books and I like to read poetry from others and I realized this is something I want more of in my life. And why should I just set it aside? Because some people don't think like it's important. If it's important to you, then it's important, full stop. So I think a lot of it was just having a bit of courage and just stepping into my own power and saying like, you know what, I'm just gonna do my life, whatever. And I found that in this journey, those people that are attracted to your message will come to you naturally. They will gravitate towards your energy. And those people that don't, don't, don't get you, that's fine. They can just, you know, 
do their own thing. So that's fine. It's it's okay. There's some there's a tribe for everybody. That's basically how I see it. Sorry. I think there's a tribe for everybody. Like mm-hmm. whatever you're into, there's a space and there's a tribe for that. Understood. Okay. So I have so much admiration for you for, you know, moving from being a doctor very hard. It's not like a little like one minute course. It's like, you know, you study hard for that. Moving away from that kind of, of the conventional medicine, doing what you're doing with your practice being being a creative and I, I have a lot for that I just I just wish that people could find a way isn't it to find a way who are stuck in their jobs or might not have the money to transition and they might have black tax I would say um, I say black tax or survivor guilt where if you come from an immigrant family it's like there, there was a saying on a podcast I went uh, I was interviewing someone and they were saying um in the most nicest way with a white counterpart. When a white person goes to a job, they go with purpose. <laughs> when, a, when, when, when a black person goes to a job, um, it's a responsibility. Oh, yes. So it's like, you're not just going just as free, like living your life. You've got sometimes the pressures of people's expectations, people back home, wherever you're, you're, you're from. It's not as easy to make those decisions. And um, I'm just so glad that you found a way because it, it, it could be, you know, you study so hard for it. You put so much investment in it. You could have just gone another, you know, you could just stuck, you know, doing what you do. Not saying we, we, we don't like doctors or anything, but I'm so glad that you found what you wanted to do and you like lived your life. So I really appreciate that. I do, I do. This is hard. It's hard in these streets. But my mom has never forgiven me when I said I wasn't going to do my PhD. Because as soon as she thought I was doing my PhD, she was telling everyone I was a doctor. And I was like, I'm yeah. not. Do that. <laughs> I get Stop it. Doing that. <laughs> I get it. She would never forgive me, but I've got to live my life, in it. got to live yeah. my yeah. life. It's important. Okay. It is. So let's go back to what I was saying earlier about marketing. Like, how? Because I say to myself, I say on here, I'm a jeweler, but I would see myself as a multidisciplinary artist. And bloody hell, like, sorry, for, but like, it's so hard just to say multidisciplinary artists and people just look at you crazy to get funding or, so how do you navigate when talking to people without, not saying you they switch off, but to get them engaged? Yes. No, no, seriously, I um, I feel your, your challenge or struggle in that because I've done that even like myself. I was like, okay, like, how do I... It's almost like a personal branding. I know they use that term a lot. It's quite business-like, but like, how do you almost identify or, or attach a label to yourself? Like you get yourself, right? As creatives, we get ourselves. It's just translating that into the world to get us. And for me, how I've seen it, like I'm slowly, like I'm, I'm figuring things out as I go along, but I'm slowly kind of just branding. I don't almost want to call it my business. It's just like my... Um, my passion and how I'm stepping into the world. I'm branding myself as a multi-passionate creative and healer because those are almost like umbrella terms that can incorporate many um, creative explorations and also many healing passions. So it's like when people ask me what I do, I say like, oh, I'm passionate about many things. I'm, I'm a life alchemist. I help people live karma, healthier, conscious lives. And then they're like, huh? And they're like, how? And then I say like, oh, well, I write poetry that can help people with this. Um, I'm also a naturopathic physician. So people can come to me for like healing of this and this and that. So it's like, I kind of give a broad statement that invites questions. And then when they ask me those questions, I break it down. So, cause essentially what I do is that like, I am a multi-passionate creative and healer. Everything else kind of slots into that. And I think that's why I kind of like, branded myself even like my business name I wanted it something that was um it spoke to sort of what I do because I consider myself as a life alchemist but it it wasn't too narrow in the in future if I were to pick up say photography which is another interest of mine but I don't do it actively so in future if I was to pick up photography I could easily incorporate it into what I do so just branding myself from day one that yeah I am a multi-passionate everything I do I or in your case 
you are multidisciplinary. It's so funny how people don't get that because I'm like, I totally get it. You, you're an artist that uses different disciplines to express yeah. your art. It's as simple as that. <laughs> it's hard in these streets. It's hard in the street. Maybe in the US, people are more, more, more free. Um, I'm glad that you explained that very um, eloquently. There was something about the, the healing bit. So when you say in my head, like creative healing, what do you mean? Great. Or some, I, I see it like creativity is medicine. There's a quote, it came from ancient Chinese medicine. And I think some kind of monk was speaking to the student and he said like, everything is your, everything can be your medicine. So our view of medicine, or I guess conventional wise would be like, you know, it'd be like medical interventions or medications, right? That's medicine. But really everything can be medicine. And I see like, and I think some of the problems we have in modern day life is because we're very stuck into like a consumerist based culture. People can like consume entertainment or they can consume social media or they can go shopping or they can consume things but not as many people are like given of themselves into the world and expressing themselves into the world. And you're an artist. So you get like, there's a joy and almost like a stress release that comes from creating things and you're a jeweler. So you particularly work with your hands and just that aspect of like using our hands, I think is very ground and it grounds us into our lives. It grounds us into the moment. It gets like all parts of our bodies, like really, settled in the moment and working together it's a form of mindfulness practice which for me that is healing and even if we're not like active creators like say you and I am a poet you're a jeweler and you do other forms of art even when we engage or we consume art like we listen to beautiful music that that can help us stress relieve that can suit our soul or if we're having a a stressful day we just um, read a beautiful piece of poetry even watch a, a movie with like scenes that can take us away and open our imagination to me that is very healing so it's uh, as a physician and healer I really see healing as very deep and very broad anything that fosters a sense of well-being and control in our lives is a type of healing and creativity is, is like an amazing way for us to gain more control of our lives for us to feel a sense of mental and physical well-being so I consider it as powerful medicine okay I hear you so there's a few things I want to pick up so western medicine African med well non-western I'm not from African I'm, I'm African descent I'm not you know by Africa but um yeah my parents are Jamaican so but my partner is Nigerian and he always talks about like how the West, how the West is. And what I'm trying to get out is like, you know, when you go see the doctor, they're like, no, no offense. You did, you, you did work in the UK. So okay. if, if, if you're not from the UK and you see a GP, a general pra practitioner, if you've got something mild going on, they give you about oh, eight or 10 minutes to, to tell you, to tell for one problem. You can't say oh, your head and your, your belly's hurting you for one problem. <laughs> And then they try to like, and they don't even look at you sometimes, they're just typing on their computer and trying to give you a prescription, trying to get you out of that office as soon as possible. Oh yes. But you probably, you, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just like, that ailment in your head, it could be connected to something what you're suppressing mentally, something going. So I think what you're doing is, I'm guessing, is more of a non-Westernized way, holistically, even though you're quite broad in your approach, you're treating the whole body spirituality mentally everything yes because you know what I mean and I feel like sometimes I think you talk, talk about a consumer culture wherever we live in especially in the west but it's just like you don't see money you don't see the overworld holistically how to and, and I don't realize people will save money in the long run if you look at holistically the person Yes, no, most definitely, Cassandra. And I get it because um, I actually studied in the UK. I studied in St. George's University of London. And I worked okay. there for a few years. So I get the whole system of the NHS and all that as well. I get it. And in the US, it's very similar. In some ways, it's kind of worse in terms of the amount of time you spend with your family physician, primary care physician, which is equivalent to our GP. But I really get it. And it's, um, it's almost like fast medicine and what we consider a person. And as an artist, I don't know if you've had this sense, you may not have, you may have, but 
our creative works are almost like birth things. They're like extensions of ourselves. You know, you could be an artist, a painter. And when you look at your, your paintings, they're an extension of you because this was something that was crafted in your mind that was now externalized as a jeweler. This was once a visual setup in your mind that you externalize. So it's a part of you that you're offering to the world. So it's very much um, when I look at a person, I um, like I develop something called alchemical healing, which does incorporate, you know, the lifestyle and the nutrition and the supplements, but it's also like creative healing. So like Again, is there parts of your life where you're creatively stagnant, where you feel that your voice is not being translated into the world? And also, like, I don't know if you're aware of like Elizabeth Gilbert um, and her work she wrote, Eat, Pray, Love and Big Magic. So it, it's also so redefining the concept of what we think is creativity, because for some people, like when you say creativity, they just they might. Oh, who are you? Have I lost you? Hello. Hello. Mirror and be creative. Oh, who, who, who? I missed you. So when you started from the okay. eat, pray, love woman, and you talked about something magic, and then you, and then I lost you. I'm not editing okay. this. We're just gonna roll a bit. Go ahead. So if you start from there. Oh, good. So you said different Sorry. types of creativity and other kind of stuff. Great. Yes. Yeah, so it's redefining our concept of what we think creativity is. Creativity, in a sense, is just expressing what's going on in our inner lives out onto the world. So you could be an engineer and do things in a slightly different or innovative way, and that's creative expression. You could be creative just by the way you put recipes and you prepare meals for your family at home. You could be creative in the garden and how you set it up and how you tend to your plants. Creativity is not just this narrow niche of like visual artists, you know? So, and I just find like when we redefine what we think is creative, it can give us a different perspective on life. Like some people think, oh, I didn't study art in school or um, I've never been good at drawing and painting and using my hands, so I'm not creative. But I think creativity is inherent in our human nature. We've always wanted to develop new tools and technologies and new ways of expressing ourselves. That is creativity. So when we fully step into our creativity, I feel we fully step into our humanity. Okay, understood. So I noticed on your website, you talk about poetry. That seems to be one of your disciplines or one of your works. So tell us about how did you get into the poetry from the holistic medicine now to the lovely poetry. Thank you. So I've been writing poetry since like my early teens, you know, I've been writing aphorisms, epigrams and poetry. I've always just liked words. And epigrams? Like, what's, what's that? Sorry. Epigrams. So those are like short witty sayings that hold a certain truth. For example, um, a bird in hand is better than two in a bush or something that would be considered. So it's like a short witted statement that holds some truth that would be considered an epigram. So I've always written things like that just from observing. I'm very much an observer of life. I like to observe things and write down my perception of those things on paper. So I've always kind of done the poetry on the side, you know. But again, like as I started to step into my creative power and my own authenticity, I've been doing it like more formally. You know, I've done like, um, what's it called? Like open mics. Sometimes I'll do open mics. I post my poetry online. I started sharing my poetry because I discovered that in writing poetry, I would almost, it's a form of expression and also like a form of therapy to me. So when I'm going through hard times or challenging times in life, or I'm going through like new life experiences or a breakup or even falling in love or anything like that, when I express it through poetry, it's a form of therapy. It's a form of like journal therapy, I guess, but in, you know, poetry therapy. And um, yeah, poetry is powerful. Um, there's even, a, I think, a quote or an epigram by, I think it was Plato, and it says like, poetry is nearer to vital truth than history. You know, because history, I think, for the most part, is written by the victors, especially if you're reading conventional history in school, which has been all like manipulated and what have you. But poetry is like a vessel which we can really use to like distill what's going on in our inner lives, you know. And I think that's why it's just persisted in song, 
in you know spoken word which is like more i guess modern type poetry yeah i think it's it's beautiful i love poetry so with poetry let me i'm gonna be a bit devil's advocate i love poetry um i do poet i don't do it as often I, the, the jewelry stuff took over um how do you hone your, hone your craft and I, and, and I say this because this is just me. I hate going to, to poetry events and it's bad. Now, I understand when people come, people have to start from somewhere. And I'm not the best poet in the world, but I'm trying to be, you know, but I don't want to, I don't want to offend you, but I don't want like, me personally. I don't like, right, when you got, when someone gets a, a scruffy piece of paper, uh, I just wrote this on the way to this, to this event and they start reading it. So I haven't even thought about the person in mind who's gave up their evening, who's in a certain type of state. So that's, that's just my little pet peeve. And it's just like honoring the space, honoring people's vi vibrations, you know, but that's just me. Maybe I should be more like you and go with the flow. So what I'm really interested in is like, how do you honor the space and, and how do you work on your craft to make sure that you're the best version when you share your stuff in the public space? Great. Um... I think for one, like everybody's different. Some people are like, and it does come, sometimes come to me like poetry on the fly, you know, you're like, I don't know, like on the train or like on the way to a friend's house or at someone's place or, or any event, you just like, if it comes to you, because I say like the muse can knock at any time, really, right? Mm. Really, the muse can knock at any time. So I go with that and I tend to always have like a, a jotting material that I can put that down and I have written poems like that especially my micro poetry comes to me a lot like that but I find like my most poignant works or heartfelt work just comes during more silent times where I've like created that sacred space to really go in like you know maybe at the end of the day or very early in the morning like I said I'm an early bird when when the world is still still and peaceful and I don't have a lot of influences coming into my mind and cluttering in my mind I find that those spaces those liminal spaces I can tap deeper with my inner truth or what wants to birth through and I find I write the most powerful poetry in those like quiet still reflective moments of the day rather than just like when the world is going on you know um, so that's one major way I guess I use to hone my craft and another way I hone my craft is just doing things regularly just just writing without judgment, just like putting it all out on the paper. And I do just still like kind of um, change words, move things around. Like I just still my poetry sometimes to make it more beautiful, but I try to not hold too tightly to judging myself as like, I'm a good poet, I'm a bad poet. Cause really I'm not trying to be a Wordsworth or a Shakespeare. I'm just trying to do me basically with my poetry. No, I hear you. I just feel like you have so much talent of, of like being, you know, I feel like I'm not a doctor, but it's just like some, some kinship of like, you have the creativeness oozing out of you. But then again, you can be quite scientific as well, you know? And sometimes it's, how do you navigate the both sides or what people say the both sides of the brain? How do you navigate that? Yeah. Um... For me, actually, I think it comes quite easily. I think it's like my personality type, because I remember even when I was in medical school, when I was surrounded by people who were very linear thinkers, I consider myself as a non-linear thinker. They were very like straight, step by step, whereas I was the one that was like always making connections between different parts of the body and different parts of things going on. So it's almost like naturally how I'm set up and maybe it does again come back to me being a multi-passionate person is that I don't really see the vision so tightly I don't see this black and white division between science and art because you know art science can be very creative when you think about like things like inventions new inventions like out of nowhere out of the ether someone comes up with this new theory or a new scientific experiment out of nowhere they birded something innovative that is creativity right there right and you know being a jeweler um there's certain yeah i mean we have like you have maybe an idea or a concept that you want to bring out in the world but there are some almost logical steps that have to be followed as well for certain making certain pieces a certain 
procedures that have to be in place. So there's a there's a linearity to your non-linearity that is scientific. So I think I find it easy to just kind of live in paradox. It's like how I'm naturally wired. I see like for me, there's no division between science and spirituality, no division between us and nature. It's to me one fluid mix, but I think it's our education and society that likes to like fit people and topics into very narrow themes, you know, and they like, like, uh, it's a way of understanding the world. So I do naturally get that, but I really don't think they're like separate. <laughs> it's just how you see it. I hear you, I hear you. It's like, it's like a blend. I'm just thinking also about how do, how do you, not diagnose, but how can you help people who have creative blocks or, 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 or find it hard to be creative? Yes. I think um, because I'm also like a mindset and self growth coach, I think a lot of things in life comes down to our mindset. So like, for instance, if I were to engage with that kind of person and work with them, I like with most things, I like to go down to the roots of it, like down to mindset. Like I find sometimes when people say they're creatively blocked, it could be because of their mindset of, first of all, what they think creativity is, what is their definition of creativity? Because I see some people who are like, say excellent cooks right or they're really good in like crafts like traditional crafts needle crafts you know textile crafts and that but because they don't they can't write very well or they can't perform visual arts they think they're not creative and I'm like you just made this amazing meal you just made up the recipe and it tastes amazing that is innovation that is creativity so again redefining what they think is creative and if they do have so-called genuine creative blocks get into the heart of it i think sometimes creative blocks could lead to a lack of inspiration or someone may need to modify their environment to have more stimulating or inspiring things in their environments or sometimes it could just again be due to these belief patterns like oh I'm not good enough or imposter syndrome someone might be like a beginner painter and just because they're not as great as their art teacher in their community art class or their friend who has been painting 10 years before them they think they're a bad painter but they're not necessarily bad it's just where they are in their like painting journey so a lot of like these creative or even life blocks to be honest come stems from limiting beliefs and mental blockage and so when I get to the heart of those mental blockages I assist people to kind of be able to work through them through different things by changing up their environments by journaling by contemplative practice by just trying sometimes it, it comes down to not overthinking things and just sitting down and doing it and just with practice you'll naturally get better in anything no, but it's really on it. Thank you so much for saying that. So before we leave, I'm just trying to um, sense with you, is there anything I should have asked you, which I haven't, or you want to say? Um, I guess more what I want to say, like, we, as we've discussed, you've mentioned that you're a multidisciplinary artist. I said I'm a multi-passionate creative. Again, it's both of us working through with different tools to bring out our creativity into the world. So if anybody feels or identifies with being either multidisciplinary artist or multi-passionate perhaps just do a little bit more personal exploration of it either online you'd be surprised that there's so many other people who identify as that and just through that research and exploration it will give you kind of more confidence just to know that you're like you're not the only one who feels this way and there's nothing wrong with you I just encourage you to, you know, have a little bit of courage and just step into your power. You don't need to explain yourself to anyone. Just do you, do the best of you and the right people will be attracted to you. Thank you for that. That's just perfect. So we leave it there. So where can we find you? Obviously you're going to put stuff in the show notes, but where can we find you? Thank you. So about me and all my works can be found on, on my website, which is www.manifestingalchemy.com. That's www.manifestingalchemy.com perfect well this is the creative sorry this is the black creative handbook we're here with dr egypt thank you for spreading all this creative healing and love and creativity for us polymaths out there or multi-passionate people i really do appreciate it so i know i found another one it's like great i mean I'm, I'm in good company all right then thank you speak soon bye